So we are going to do this problem from a University of Cambridge math examination. Find the coefficient of x to the n in the expansion in ascending powers of x of 9 over 2 minus x squared times 1 plus x, and state the set of values of x for which this expansion is valid. Now this question is asking us to do two things. The first thing it's talking about is the expansion in ascending powers of x. Well, ascending powers of x is just going to be x to the first power, x to the second power, x to the third power, and so on. In other words, this is just talking about a basic Taylor series. We're looking at a Taylor series centered at zero for this function. So let's get started on that first part. In order to find a Taylor series of this, it's not very nice, this function the way it is now, because we have multiple things in the denominator. And Taylor series are a lot easier when we just have one thing to work with in the denominator. So let's try and set it up so we get a little easier function. 9 over 2 minus x squared times 1 plus x. Let's do partial fraction decomposition on this function here so that we can get it into multiple parts. That means we're going to end up with, at the end, a over 2 minus x squared plus b over 2 minus x plus c over 1 plus x. And we're going to use the cover-up method for partial fractions to solve this. Now, if you aren't familiar with the cover-up method, I'll link a video from Black Pen Red Pen in the description explaining how that works. Because we have a quadratic term here, it's going to get a little tricky using the cover-up method, but we can still use it for a lot of these terms. Starting with the 1 plus x in the denominator. Because there's only 1 plus x to the first power, we can use the cover-up method on it. So if we want 1 plus x to be 0, that means x has to be negative 1. So we go over here and cover up 1 plus x. That's going to leave us with 9 over 2 minus x squared. If x is negative 1, we'll have 9 over 2 minus negative 1 squared. 2 minus negative 1 is 3. 9 over 3 squared is 1. So that means c is going to be equal to 1. There's one other one of these terms that we can use with the cover-up method. And I'll tell you a little secret here. We are actually able to use the cover-up method for a. We're always able to use the cover-up to find the coefficient where the denominator is to the highest power. So we can't use it for b, but we are allowed to use it for a. So if we think about what happens here, 2 minus x to equal 0, we're going to have to have x equal 2. So we go over here, cover up 2 minus x squared, we're going to need 9 over 1 plus 2. Well, 1 plus 2 is 3. 9 over 3 is going to be 3. So that is our second coefficient. Now with this final coefficient, b over 2 minus x, we're not going to be able to use the cover-up method, but we can still use a little trick to help us skip some algebra with this. We know every single part of this equation, a and c, the only thing we don't know is b. This equation is true for every value of x. So one thing we could do is pick a random value of x that we haven't used yet and plug it in and then just solve for c based on that. So let's choose x equals 0 to make it a little easier. In that case, on the left side, we're going to have 9 over 2 minus 0 squared. That'll be 2 squared, which is 4. And then we just multiply by 1. We don't have to worry about that. Equals. On this side, 3 over 2 minus 0 squared is again 4, plus b over 2. And then plus c is equal to 1 over 1 plus 0 is just 1. So now all we need to do is solve for b, and this is a basic algebra equation. So I'll skip the steps and get to the answer that b is equal to 1. So now we have all of the values that we need for our partial fraction decomposition, and our job is to find the Taylor series of each of these components here. Let's start off with the simplest one, 1 over 1 plus x. Now in order to do all of these Taylor series, we're going to need the fact that 1 over 1 minus x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n. This is the Taylor series for 1 over 1 minus x. And for these other functions here, we're going to try to write them in terms of 1 over 1 minus x. Starting with this one, 1 over 1 plus x, well, that's equal to 1 over 1 minus negative x. 
And the important thing here is that we're trying to transform our original function into something of the form one over one minus whatever. So in this case, one minus negative x does the trick. And that means this is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of this input negative x to the n. And we want to rewrite this so that we have some constant times x to the n. To do that, we can use the fact that negative x to the n is the same as negative one to the n times x to the n. So we just split up that power. That's the first Taylor series that we need. The next one we're going to look at is one over two minus x. For this one, our goal is to transform this two into a one. And in order to do that, all we need to do is factor out a two from the denominator. So we can write two minus x as two times one minus a half x. This is equal to one half times one over one minus a half x. And now we can plug in our Taylor series. We have one half times the sum from n equals zero to infinity of our input in this case instead of x is one half x to the n. Now if we want to turn this into the form that we have here, first of all we can bring the one half to the inside. If we look at the power of one half that we have now, it's going to be one half to the n times another one half, which means we'll end up with one half to the power of n plus one. Then we multiply that by x to the n. Now the last series we need to look at is three over two minus x squared. In this one, we're not going to be able to transform directly into one over one minus x. Instead, let's start from the series that we derived here. This is the Taylor expansion for one over two minus x. And one thing that we can do with this expansion is take the derivative with respect to x. And the reason we would do that is that the derivative of one over two minus x is equal to, if we do all our derivative rules, one over two minus x squared, what we're looking for for this function. So now all we need to do is take the derivative with respect to x of every term inside this series. Assuming it's convergent absolutely, we can bring that derivative inside of the summation. So this is going to be equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity. Again, we bring the derivative to the inside of one half to the n plus one times x to the n. One half to the n plus one doesn't matter because we're differentiating with respect to x. That means when we differentiate x to the n by the power rule, we get n x to the n minus one. And that's all we need to do for our derivative. Now notice we have a little bit of an issue with this sum here. Our goal at the end is to put all of the summations together. The first two have x to the n and x to the n, but this one is x to the n minus one. So we really want to change it into x to the n. First of all, let's notice that when n equals zero, we're gonna be multiplying by n inside the summation. If we multiply it by zero, it's just gonna go away. So the n equals zero case doesn't really matter. Let's change that to n equals one. It won't affect our answer. But now what we can do is substitute a new variable u equals n minus one. And the reason we'll do that is so that we get x to the power of u on the right side here. And then we can put all of those sums together at the end. If we do that, we'll also have that n is equal to u plus one. So let's try plugging this in. We're going to get the sum from u equals well, if n is one, n minus one is just gonna be zero, to infinity of one half to the n is u plus one, and then plus another one, so plus two, times n is u plus one, times x to the u. So these one, two, three here are the series that we need in order to construct our final summation that we're looking for. So we have all the components that we need for our Taylor series now, and it's time to put them under the same umbrella of one big summation. So this function that we have on the left is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of, first we have three over two minus x squared, so that's gonna be three times what we have right here. I'll put the n plus one first, 
times 1 half to the n plus 2. And we'll save the x to the n for the very end because we know that's in all of those series. Next, we have to add 1 over 2 plus x. So that's going to be plus a half to the n plus 1 is the same as 2 times a half to the n plus 2. And then finally, we're adding 1 over 1 plus x. That's going to be negative 1 to the n. And we multiply that by x to the n. Now let's do just a little bit of simplification. Because we have 1 half to the n plus 2 in two different places here, we can factor that out and make this series a little bit smaller. So we're going to end up with 3 times n plus 1 is 3n plus 3. And then we're going to add another 2 on the end. So that 3 and then plus 2 is going to give us 5 times 1 half to the n plus 2. And then we'll add that negative 1 to the n. All of this times x to the n. That is the final result for our Taylor series of 9 over 2 minus x squared times 1 plus x. So we have our series here, and it's time to get to the second part of the question. State the set of values of x for which this expansion is valid. So this is asking us, what is the interval of convergence for this series? In order to figure that out, we're going to use something called the ratio test, which says, if we take the limit as n approaches infinity of the n plus 1 term of the series divided by the nth term of the series, this result can tell us whether the series converges. If it's less than 1, then we know the series converges. If it's greater than 1, then the series diverges. And if it's equal to 1, then we don't know yet, and we're going to have to try a little harder to figure out that case. But we can start out by figuring out the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n for our series. To do that, we need to start out by plugging in n plus 1 to everything in this series, putting it on the top of our fraction here. So that's going to give us 3 times n plus 1 is going to be 3n plus 3. And then if we add 5, we'll get 3n plus 8. Then we multiply by a half to the n plus 3 plus negative 1 to the n plus 1. And that's going to be multiply this whole thing by x to the n plus 1. And we divide through by exactly what we have here, because this is already plugged in n. So with this whole fraction here, notice immediately that we have an x to the n plus 1 divided by x to the n factored out of everything. So we can easily cancel that out, and it's just going to leave us with an x to the first power on the top. Now what we need to do is take the limit as n approaches infinity of this fraction that we have here. So we need to start thinking about what's going on inside of this massive fraction that we have. It's not actually as complicated as it looks, though. Because take a look, first of all, at these two terms on the left of the numerator and the denominator. They're each multiplied by 1 half to the n plus 3 and 1 half to the n plus 2. Even though this n on the inside is getting bigger over time, 1 half to the n is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so much more than that n is getting bigger. Over time, this is going to end up going to 0 and so is the part on the top. On the other hand, negative 1 to the n is just going to go back and forth between negative and positive 1. So as n increases, we can basically say these two parts don't really matter. The only parts that are still important are negative 1 to the n plus 1 and negative 1 to the n. If we take the absolute value of negative 1 to the n plus 1, that's just going to give us 1. Same with negative 1 to the n. So we really don't worry about this part either. Doesn't matter. The only thing that's left is this x right here. The limit as n approaches infinity of this whole thing is equal to the absolute value of x. And we know the series converges when that's less than 1. So that gives us a lot of information about the convergence. We know that when the absolute value of x is less than 1, it converges. And when the absolute value of x is greater than 1, it diverges. So all we have to do is check for when absolute value of x is equal to 1. 
That means that we need to check for when x is equal to 1 and x is equal to negative 1. We're not sure about these yet. But when we look at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1, it's actually not going to take that long either. To see why that's true, let's try plugging in, first of all, x equals negative 1. If we do that, we're going to get negative 1 to the n right here. And let's take a look at each component of the series that we have here. Just like before, as n approaches infinity, if we just have a negative 1 to the n out here, a half to the n plus 2 is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. This part's going to end up going to 0, because x to the n is not changing magnitude. So we can ignore this. We know that part converges absolutely. On the other hand, we have negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the n. Well, that's going to give us 1. And if we do the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1, well, that definitely doesn't converge. So the x equals negative 1 case diverges. And a similar argument is going to apply to x equals positive 1. If we put in 1 to the n here, just like before, this part, 1 half to the n, is going to converge absolutely. And that's going to go to 0 really fast. So we just need to look at negative 1 to the n. If we do the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, since multiplying it by 1 to the n doesn't do anything, that means we're going to have 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1, and so on. Because each time, we're going to flip between negative 1 to an even power and negative 1 to an odd power. Does this series converge? No, it doesn't, because the sum is going to alternate between 1 and then 1 minus 1 is 0, and then plus 1 is 1, and then minus 1 is 0, and so on. It's never going to approach one specific value. So x equals 1 also diverges, which means that our series is only going to converge when the absolute value of x is strictly less than 1. So when we're looking at these types of problems, especially when we get very, very ugly, complicated looking expressions, and especially when we're looking at limits, it helps to take a step back and think about what parts of this expression are really important and which parts can we kind of set to the side. In this case, by realizing that 1 half to the n is going to get small really, really fast, we were able to focus in on that negative 1 to the n power that was more important, and that got us to our answer just like this.